Welcome to The Lead, a New Lines podcast. I'm your host, Rasha Ilasin Beirut, and with us today is Lebanese artist and architect, Rayan Tabit, who joins us from his studio in San Francisco. Thank you for joining us today, Rayan. Thank you for having me, Rasha. Rayan, let me start by saying that I came upon your exhibit called Arabesque while visiting the Sfer Art Gallery in Beirut, and immediately I thought I must speak to this artist. And so here we are. But before we get into the Arabesque exhibit and what it means, why don't you tell us about the wonderful anecdote at your grandparents' home when an old photograph of a man caught your eye again and again, and how years later you decided to go back to your grandparents' apartment and investigate that photograph. Tell us about that. So growing up in Beirut, I used to have lunch at my maternal uh, grandparents' house every other Sunday. They lived in a a large cold apartment and so i spent most of my time sitting in a chair in the dining room trying to behave from that chair i could see the photograph of a man hanging on the wall that did not look like any of us in the family and the spine of a bright yellow book piled up among other books in the on the shelves and a book in german a language that none of us spoke. And so whenever I I would ask my parents about the strange man's photograph, they just would tell me, this is your great grandfather's friend, Max, and nothing more of that. So years later, when I was helping my parents empty that apartment after my grandparents had both passed away, I discovered in a box a series of letters, uh, postcards uh, between my great grandfather and an illustrious man called Max von Oppenheim, and a series of photographs taken at Tel Halaf, which is a city that sits today on the border between Syria and Turkey. The photographs were taken in the summer of 1929, and where my great-grandfather seemed to be taking part of an archaeological expedition or a series of digs in that summer. Mm. It, that a discovery actually coincided with an invitation. So it was around 2016 that this happened. And that coincided with an invitation from the DAAD, which is an artist in residency program in Berlin that had invited me to come and spend a year uh, in Berlin to do research and develop a new body of work. Uh, Back then I had just finished a a, lar- a, a long-term, multi-year, multi-part project on the Trans-Arabian Pipeline. And I was looking for a new story or a new project to think about. And so I just took this material that I had just found. I was like, I'm going to Germany. This man ha- ha- seems Germanic. Maybe I can figure out something about who this Max von Oppenheim person is. So, so this, just um, to clarify, this was, you discovered all this in 2016, But the photograph dates from which year? From 1929, from the summer of 1929. And so so I took this material with me and not long after arriving there to Berlin, I just started looking up, you know, Max von Oppenheim and realized that Max von Oppenheim was a German diplomat and amateur archaeologist who had done this uh, quite extensive dig in Tal Halaf. Most of uh, the objects uh, uh, from this dig ended up at the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. And so I just sent an an email to the Pergamon Museum asking if I could meet with anyone that could give me a bit more information about the dig in Tal Halaf and who Max von Oppenheim is. And so very soon after, I found myself at the Pergamon meeting Nadia Kolidis and Lutz Martin, who were curators and conservators at the Pergamon Museum. That uh, And, and I, honestly, the beginning of that meeting was quite stunted. They didn't know what to do with me. I didn't know what to do with them. They hadn't really interacted with a contemporary artist. And I was not really coming to them with an ask, right? I just was like, I just wanted to show them these photographs and material that I had trying to unlock a family secret. And so so very quickly into our meeting, I showed them the, the few photographs I had and they looked at me and they said, you know, we've been waiting for you 
all these years. Wow. And I was like, what do you mean? And basically what it was is that Nadia and Lutz had spent more than a decade of their career working on reconstructing the destroyed parts of the Tel Halaf temple, which had been brought to Berlin after Max von Oppenheim's expedition ended in 1929 and after the archaeological remains were divided between the, the Germans and the authorities of the French mandate that governed Syria and Lebanon back then. Uh -huh. And Max von Oppenheim originally wanted to sell all these finds to the Pergamon Museum, which at the time, in the 1930s, was not at all interested in the material from Tel Halaf. It did not come from what was then called monolithic civilization or major civilizations like the Romans or the Greek or mm -hmm. the Egyptians. They came from a rather minor civilization called the Neo-Hittites. And so discouraged by the fact that the Pergamon did not agree to purchase this material, Max von Oppenheim, who was the son of a wealthy banker from Cologne, opened his own museum in Berlin which was called the Tel Halaf Museum, where he showed all this material. And in 1930, the museum opened its doors to the public. When the Second World War broke out, during one of the nightly air raids on Berlin, the Tel Halaf Museum was targeted directly by Allied forces with a phosphorus bomb that caused a fire that destroyed everything that had been brought from Syria. Mm -hmm. except all these objects that had been made out of basalt stone, which is a volcanic rock that could sustain heat. But mm -hmm. when firefighters came to douse the flames, they threw cold water on the hot stone that shattered all these artifacts into 27,000 fragments. Not discouraged by this, Max von Oppenheim went back to the ruins of his museum, gathered all this material, and before evacuating Berlin, went to the Pergamon Museum and said, could you just store this material until I can come back and figure out what to do with it? So this material was stored in nine uh, crates in the basements of the Pergamon Museum, awaiting the return of Max von Oppenheim. Max von Oppenheim died in 1947, and after the, sec the end of the Second World War, Berlin was divided in half, where the Pergamon Museum sat on one side of the Berlin Wall, and the von Oppenheim family was on the other side. So it was not until the 1990s, after the reunification of Germany, that the family could be reunited with the ruins of a temple that had sat in fragments in the basement of the Pergamon. And that is when... And the Pergamon uh, was in East Berlin. That's correct. Yeah, and yeah. that, But that is also when, during that period, the Neo-Hittite civilization had gained an interest for the archaeological community. And the discovery was that the largest Neo-Hittite temple in the world was sitting in pieces in the basement of the Pergamon. Wow. And that's when, in 2001, Nadia Kolidis and Lutz Martin were brought on to start piecing together a 27,000-piece puzzle. It yeah, would take and, them and, a decade. Yeah, how tragic that it was all basically, it had been uh, destroyed into fragments by the phosphorus bomb before anybody That's knew right. that, even what their value was. Right? That's yeah. right. And so they, this kind of process took them about 10 years to complete. And in 2011, they had put back together 26,000 of, of those pieces. During their research, and so they became, in a way, through that process, the lead knowledge producers on not only Tel Halaf as a site, but also the complex and contradictory life of Max von Oppenheim himself. And during their research, uh, they came uh, across the, the material uh, from the expedition of Max von Oppenheim, because Max von Oppenheim had done expeditions in Tel Halaf uh, in 1911, between 1911 and 1913, and then again between 1926 and 1929. Mm -hmm. And so in the photographs from the second expedition of Max von Oppenheim, they came across many photos where, you know, unnamed 
people sat in the background of those photographs because most of the time archaeologists and photographers and architects which are mostly uh, people coming from the west are have names have uh, personas have stories but people that are local that help out in these archaeological exca ex excavations and are the support staff remain unknown and yeah, one of those people remains, was my great grandfather. Yeah, and that remains and a controversy so, today. So one of them was your great grandfather. And, okay. And that is in a way, but in, in the photographs that they came across, my great grandfather sat in the background of these photos. But in the photos that I had, he was in the foreground of them, right? Because he was the subject of his own story. And so my great grandfather was one of the many unnamed figures in the background of these photos. And it was only until 2017 when I met with them that we could start basically at least naming some of these unnamed characters. And that's why... Uh, they told me we've been waiting for you because they wow. had seen my great grandfather in the background of all these photos. Yeah. And I think that really set up a very um, particular type of, of dynamic and it really changed, in my opinion, the, the interaction, right? Where it was no longer me as a contemporary artist uh, investigating this particular story, encountering a museum, you know, an institution, an uh, encyclopedic museum, and trying to collaborate with them but it was mostly it was more at the as the great grandson of somebody who had participated in the dig the objects of which ended up in these museums trying to somehow fill the gap of that void wow yeah so tell us more about this oppenheim gentleman and the intrigue surrounding him he was a german diplomat german spy and what was the story with the Bedouin jackets that turned to tent? Yeah, so, you know, the I would say that this encounter really led to a series of, of works that look into this the complex and contradictory life of Max von Oppenheim, who originally was sent in the late 19th century as a German diplomat to live in Egypt and to start developing relationships with uh, politicians and community leaders in the region as part of the German uh, project to develop a railroad that would connect Baghdad to Berlin, which was a late 19th century project between the the Germans and, and the Ottoman Empire. So he was stationed in the area first to do reconnaissance missions. And on one of these reconnaissance missions, he ended up in the late 19th century uh, um, stopping at the village of Tal Halaf just for an overnight stay on his way to Baghdad. And during that night, he was told by the Bedouins in the village that there are uh, demons and monsters hiding underground around the village. Mm -hmm. And intrigued by the story, he was taken to a site where recently discovered artifacts had been unearthed and very quickly became obsessed with Halaf, with the village, with what was there. And soon after, actually, his official diplomatic mission was was curtailed and he uh, kept going back uh, to Tal Halaf as what we call right now an amateur archaeologist which is mm -hmm. before the professionalization of the field many many people were leading uh, digs in the region as amateur archaeologists and in this sorry and that's when he started discovering these kind of major finds and then calling upon the expertise of like I said a group of architects and photographers and scientists and botanists and a whole slew of, of, of people to attempt at kind of reconstructing this lost civilization. Um, but um, at the same time, Max started um, a, a study of uh, the movement of Bedouin tribes uh, and uh, basically the genealogy of Bedouin tribes stationed not only in Tal Halaf, but all over the region. Mm -hmm. And in parallel to uh, leading the dig at the site of Tal Halaf, he also started this ethnographic and anthropological work on Bedouin tribes, which was would later be published in the late 40s and is until today the only massive research into the lives, 
customs and movements of Bedouin tribes from North Africa to the so-called Levant and the Gulf. Mm -hmm. This material it would turn out, sorry, this material turn as it turns out was later used during because this material was also relayed to the uh, German military because remember from the late 19th century all the way to the uh, 1929 and then the second world war Germany had lost one major war which was world war one and they were very active participants in world war ii and so during yeah. rommel's uh, attack in north africa the material the um, ethnographic and archaeological material uncovered by uh, max von oppenheim had actually been used by the german military to identify places where they could attack in north africa knowing when certain lands would be empty depending following the maps that uh, Max von Oppenheim had drawn of the movement of Bedouin tribes between summer and winter and so it, I became really interested in this idea of archaeological ethnographic and anthropological studies that claim to be you know objective but ultimately could be militarized and one of this became uh, the lead inspiration for a work that I did called Exquisite Corpse that follows this information that Max came across when he realized that the design of uh, Bedouin jackets, the bishop, uh, is actually made in a way so that the jacket could be turned into a tent if um, a Bedouin uh, tribesman uh, finds themselves stranded in the desert. Mm -hmm. This material was then relayed to the German military that started issuing um, a certain type of tent called a sin single soldier tent, mm -hmm. which is a jacket uh, that could be turned into a tent if stranded in the battlefield. That material was then relayed to the French and then to the US, to the Americans, and then to the Russians. And you mm -hmm. can trace the over a hundred years of military intervention by these forces in North Africa, the Levant and the Gulf. So from the late 19th century to the early 21st century of this very specific type of tent. And so the work that I developed out of this is I went on a search to procure uh, these tents from these different uh, countries, militaries, and periods, and try and piece together a history of the region by looking at this particular design object that holds within it the complexities and the contradictions at the core of military intervention in the region. Wow, who would have guessed that <laughs> this very ubiquitous military tent that's used by so many countries actually started with the um, the coat cover that Bedouins use and have used for centuries. It's quite amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think, I mean, maybe, <clears throat> sorry, <throat> if I can just say one thing, that it's important to also put the the, this project in a larger context, you know, back in 2016, one of the main conversations that was happening, at least in the field of archaeology and history, was the preservation of cultural heritage, particularly coming out of Syria, because that was the time when we were receiving news and images from the destruction of Palmyra. And mm -hmm. what really fascinated me in following this, this story this, this, this is precisely this, just for context, this was during the the Syria war from 2011 through like 2021. Yes, so carry on. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and and the discourse in uh, was that at the time was that objects, cultural artifacts, are safer in Western institutions. Mm -hmm. And for me, bringing out the story of what happened to Tel Halaf is precisely the counter example of this. These the objects that had remained in Syria actually were saved from the Second World War. And most of the objects destroyed had been destroyed in a Western institution at the Pergamon Museum at the hand of Allied forces 
in Berlin. And so I think maybe that's something that's a larger interest of mine, which is at moments of extreme polarization or particular ways of thinking about history, it is always important to to look back at examples that maybe um, trouble or challenge some of the narratives that are, are circulated. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested in uh, the entire Fragments project that included several large-scale installations to start troubling this question of the sanctity of Western institutions and the relative or the semblance of safety of objects sitting in those institutions. Yeah. And, you know, another intriguing thing about this whole story that's very apropos of all the twists and turns is that the Tel Halef Museum in Berlin, which was basically Max Oppenheim's museum, uh, was visited by Max Malowin and his wife, who was none other than Agatha Christie. And she writes about it in her memoir, does she not? That's right. So that's another thing that was so interesting in in realizing that, you know, we think of Agatha Christie as this like crime novelist. And if you look at her own history, her second husband was indeed Max Mellowan, who was a, a major British archaeologist who spent a lot of time, particularly in Iraq. And a lot of the crime novels that she wrote actually were written as she was waiting for her husband to come back from the dig. Mm -hmm. And so her, one of her, she, there's a book called by Agatha Christie, a nonfiction book called Come Tell Me How You Live, uh, which is a, a record of her time spent in the region. And in one of those chapters, she recalls meeting Max von Oppenheim first in Iraq, but then again in Berlin when her and her husband visited the Tel Halef Museum in 1930 and came across all these objects before they had been destroyed uh, during the war. Mm. Okay, well, now let's transition to your exhibit, Arabesque. Why don't you give us an overview of the Arabesque collection and just start by describing what it is? What, basically, so what, I, yeah, what exactly is the style of Arabesque and describe the exhibit to us? Okay, so I, again, we need to put things a little bit more in context. So I think that the fragments, which is the series concerned with the multiple lives of objects from Tel Halaf and the life of Max von Oppenheim, really set me on a path to look at the 19th century as a moment where, you know, because in a way I, I grew up in, 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 in a time where uh, history in a way was taught primarily um, in, the, in the aftermath of the Second World War. And a, a lot of the, the way the discourse of contemporary history is really led by the fallout of that war. But looking at, looking deeply into the life of Max von Oppenheim and what happened at Tel Halaf, I became convinced that our contemporary condition is really led by these moments in the 19th century where language around the creation of nations, language around cultural property, language around history was actually developed really back then. And like many of my projects, they all start with accidents. I, every time I go back to Beirut, I, I like to visit a place called Arconciel, which is a secondhand um, NGO that concerns itself with supporting uh, people with different mobilities and addiction. But it's also, and some, part of their fundraising or the way they raise funds is they uh, also have like a secondhand shop where you can go and, you know, find furniture and some trinkets. And in one of my visits to Arkon, they have they have uh, locations in Damur and in Beirut. One of my on one of my visits to this place, just like looking for random stuff for inspiration, I found in the trash a manuscript, basically a book published in the late 19th centuries in 1892, called Précis de l'Art Arabe by a French ornamental specialist called Jules Bourgoin. What drew me to that book in the trash is that it just had these 
it was a really beautifully illustrated, about 300 illustrations, drawings of architecture, carpentry, calligraphy from around Egypt, uh, Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine, which had been the result of uh, another archaeological uh, mission that was led by the French in the 19th century in the area. I just, you know, took the book with me and mm -hmm. I just started digging deep into the life of the, another illustrious character called Jules Bourgoin. And through that, I was introduced to this concept of the arabesque, which is a term that is that comes from the Italian called arabesco, which means in the Arab style, which was coined in the 17th century as a way to both describe the Arab influence in European architecture, particularly in Venetian architecture, which is a result of the centuries of relationships between the Ottoman Empire and Venice, but also extended to describe things that were foreign, right? So a shape that one could not understand or a movement that went beyond the standard form or even a sound that sounded maybe different. And so for many years, there was a confusion between the term arabesque in the Arab style, mooresque in the Moorish style in reference to the Moors, who are the people that lived in North Africa, mm -hmm. and grotesque, which is a term mm -hmm. that came from the German of things that came from caves. Mm -hmm. And all of that contributed to the confusion and to the further othering of non-Europeans, right? So the thing, the other, became basically the arabesque. So either a person, a form, a sound, a movement, something that is foreign that could not be described. And that, in my opinion, is at the root of some of the confusions and complexities and contradictions and particularities of the worlds we live in today. And so I started thinking, like, what if that could be a way to think through our present moment? So in the show that you saw in Beirut, I presented. Uh, so sorry, I started doing a series but, but uh, because I want. Rayan, hold on. I want to interrupt you for a second and just go back to arabesque, moresque, grotesque. I mean, wasn't the term grotesque not necessarily a derogatory term? Because now we understand it as being deformed and ugly and just counter aesthetic and sick in a way, you know, like an unhealthy form. Was that the case back then? Surely that was not so, equated with arabesque, which was also, you know, basically a form of art through the Western gaze, was it not? So if we want traces etymologically, it there is confusion between these three terms. And so it's not about saying one is good and the other is bad. It's saying that for centuries, they have been used interchangeably. And in that interchange, sometimes, depending on the context in which they're used, they are interpreted very differently. It's mm -hmm. just that what is common to all of those interpretations is the notion of the other, the notion that you're looking at something foreign to yourself, mm -hmm. whether you look at it as something that is deformed and sick, or even whether you look at it as something exotic, Right. Both of those, uh, these, sorry, ways of looking still distance you from the very thing you're looking at, yes. as if this is different who you are. And so I was really interested in this idea. And so particularly, sorry, I started then, I was like, okay, I have this manuscript, what can I do with it? Mm -hmm. And I... I started looking at the life of Jules Bourgoin, who, like I said, was an ornamental specialist that had been sent in basically the 1870s as part of the French archaeological mission to Egypt to make surveys of uh, architecture, carpentry, calligraphy, and art in the region. And he is actually the one who would later publish many books. One is called, the two maybe, sorry, most famous ones are called L'Art Arabe, Arab Art, and Demande de l'Art Arabe, The Elements of Arab Art which mm -hmm. set the standard of how the West 
perceived Arab art, which is, again, a confusion between carpentry, architecture, calligraphy, art, and, and also contributed to the rise of this kind of Orientalist food, where uh, these, these surveys were used by interior designers in Paris particularly to create these fake Arab interiors, right? These fake or imagined interiors that are made out of a mashup of, of material surveyed by Bourgoin. So very late in his life, he wanted to publish a treaty to maybe trouble or challenge the very project he had taken part of by saying that, you know, I thought I was doing this kind of scientific survey, but then I am seeing how my work is being instrumentalized in creating this like imagined exotic image of this other place. And that is when he had the project to, to publish this book called Le Précis de l'Art Arabe that actually deconstructs the very forms he had surveyed. And saying that actually geometry is a way to connect these places that look at the surface that they might not share certain languages. So in a way, he was going against this idea of Arabesque or Orientalism as a distancing mechanism, but by breaking down every single element he had surveyed to its basic geometry, it was an attempt at him to find common grounds, right, between European developments in architecture and art and the ones that he had surveyed. This was a, a book that was uh, the uh, published in very few quantities and actually it was one of the w the works of his that was almost put to the side because it didn't follow the canonical right like uh, uh it, it didn't follow the the logic right of of not only the rest of his work but how that Arab art had entered, sorry, the European canon. And this is, it just happened that by accident, this was the very manuscript that I had found. And so I was like, okay, how, what can I do with this material? Mm -hmm. And so the piece itself is a series of 236 uh, works on paper, where I take every single page from that book. So these, this manuscript from 1892 had 265, sorry, engravings, which each engraving is printed on the front of the page and the back of the page is left empty. Mm -hmm. And so what I did is I proceeded to cut apart every single page of this manuscript in specific geometric composition and fold these cut out pieces to the back of the page so that basically when you're looking at the work that I made, you're looking at almost like destroyed parts of this manuscript that mm -hmm. then appear as new forms mm -hmm. with the idea of doing to the manuscript what basically the manuscript had done to the original surveyed material, which is to interpret it, to deconstruct it, and in a way to appropriate it, right? So it's a form of kind of reversing part of this, uh, you know, part of the gesture in an attempt to maybe find these other forms hidden within the work. Right. And so I think this idea of confronting this past, not by negating it or destroying it, but by using the very tools it developed to figure out a way to reimagine it. And if you think about it, that's very similar to the, the attitude or the um, impulse uh, that led most of the works for fragment it, it, it developed for the fragments project you know i'm always interested in 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 finding within the story the seeds for its own unmaking thing that within the tools that we have at our disposal are can help us challenge the very system that has created these tools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just to give a visual of the exhibit, which I saw, which I found to be exquisite, it's sort of like a decoupage of the actual 
ornamental pages that Bourguin has a manuscript. Uh, yeah, I don't know how else to describe it other than uh, deconstructing what he did, reconstructing it, reappropriating it, as you say, and rechanging, reversing the gaze. And it's really quite a exquisite exhibit. So thank you for that. And yeah, yeah if you, even if you think, yeah, sorry, but even if you think about it as a word, right, the word cut out, mm-hmm. right, that you are, that if you think of the tool, right, like I use the exacto knives and blades to cut the pages, to fold the pages, to reimagine. So in a way, even though the work comes across as this kind of minimal, elegant, ethereal, beautiful, there's something actually quite violent at the center of it. There's something, not only the violence of the survey, the original survey itself and thinking about scientific knowledge and the some of the violence in, in involved within those expeditions, but the very gesture, my own gesture, is in and of itself a violent one, right? Like I am, but I'm also... Cl- trying to reclaim this document, right? That this document from the 19th century could also be one that could be thought of today and that could also be transformed. And that's a balance that has always been at the center of my work, the trying to come to terms with the beauty, the elegance, but also the tragedy and the violence at the center of the creative process. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the concept and architecture known as the ornament of crime. Oh, so, <laughs> so I, so I am trained originally as an architect. Like you said, I started studying at the American University of Beirut before uh, moving to a uh, Cooper Union in New York. And in many of my uh, art and architecture classes, one of the kind of founding foundational texts in architecture school until today is an essay by Adolf Loos called Ornament and Crime, uh, which is also considered one of the founding texts for modernism. Uh, which basically talks about this idea of uh, ornamentation being superfluous, the idea of uh, thinking of modernity and the, the modern time as being clean, white, without ornament, without any any decoration, that things need to be honest, need to be clear, that nothing should be superfluous. And very quickly, the essay then starts thinking of criminals, starts talking, sorry, about criminals and tattoos and how equates the kind of the or- the tattoos on criminals' bodies, sorry, e- equates ornamentation to tattoos to criminality. And, you know, this is a text that is not only, like I said, taught in architecture schools, it's the foundation of uh, modernism. And, and I have to say that I just accepted it as it is, right? That it is also the foundation of my own, my own training and my own thinking. And in working on uh, the Arabesque series, which not only includes the work that you saw in Beirut, but it's an ongoing series that now I'm also thinking about it in music. I'm also thinking about it in dance, developing works around that, attempting to deconstruct those concepts too. I reread that text and found how much not only problematic is this text, but that it really assumed the a very narrow uh, vision of what not only what ornamentation can, should be, but really set the standard for modernism and the international style as a white, clean space yeah. where anything that is not that is actually considered a criminal and it is considered other. And so I think that it is part of thinking, particularly at this moment, the limits of the modernist doctrine, 
the limits and how this modernist doctrine has been used in the last century, particularly after World War II, to create the semblance of a kind of mid-century modern aesthetic that as much as it has value also uh, came hand in hand with um, very specific political doctrines uh, that kind of introduced not only in Europe but all over the world, like in places like Brazil, in places like the Philippines and places like Egypt or Lebanon, this idea that modernity means uh, the absolute erasure of our own indigenous styles, ideas, thoughts, cultures to be replaced with basically concrete and whitewashed walls, right? That color was not allowed, that ornaments were not allowed, that anything of our own self is considered other, which for me is a very, it, it adds to the complexity of this otherness when you yourself become othered from yourself. Mm -hmm. And so in this kind of process of expanding on this notion of the arabesque is also trying to rethink or reread the very foundational texts uh, that set the standard for the fields in which I operate in, which are art and architecture. Mm. Well, this sort of brings us to another exhibit that you did called The Return. Why don't you tell us about that? So that's another, if you allow me to take you on another anecdote <laughs> and like another accident, you know, because also the thing is that's how my work is really led by accidental encounters, right? From the photographs in my grandparents' house to this book in the trash of a secondhand store to basically, I, you know, every time I go back to Beirut, I like to visit the National Museum. It's one of my favorite places. It's an incredible museum with a really rich collection and a very particular history, contemporary history, connected with its uh, placement uh, on the green line that divided Beirut between East and West during the Civil War and the importance of that cultural of, of that museum, not only in the psyche of all Lebanese during the war, but also the reconstruction of that museum after the war was a very interesting example of the possibility of recognizing the what had happened during the war and, and keeping the scars on display as one moves into the reconstruction phase, which is something that really did not happen in the rest of the country and is, in my opinion, part of the problem we're facing today. But besides that, so this is one of the reasons why I go there every single time I'm in Beirut. And in the summer of 2018, when I went to visit it, and usually, sorry, this is a museum where there's a, it's a permanent exhibition. So there's rarely new objects that are put on display. But back in the summer of 2018, at the entrance of the museum were five recently placed objects with a banner next to them that said, recently repatriated objects to Lebanon. And one of those objects was a rather small head of a bull uh, carved in marble. So I went closer to just read more information about these objects. And the story kind of go talks about the an excavation that took place in the summer of 1967 uh, by Maurice Dunant, who was a French archaeologist stationed in Lebanon since the 1920s. And then basically the banner goes on to say, then these objects disappeared and they reappeared. There's no mention of what happened, <laughs> where did they, where, how did they disappear, where did they reappear, and what happened to them. That's right, these objects disappeared and then reappeared. Mm -hmm. And I was so fascinated by just this one sentence. Mm -hmm. And so I started like many things, other, like, as you figured out by now, I'm just really curious and I'm relentless. So I just started asking questions and I quickly figured out that basically in this excavation that took place in 1967 by Maurice Dunant uncovered 
about 2,500 objects from the Temple of Ishmoon, which is a temple in, in Saida, in South Lebanon. And a lot of these objects had been kept in the storerooms of the temple in Saida. When the war broke out in 1975, Saida, which is closer to the border with occupied territories, became increasingly like a hotspot. And so there was a decision from the then director of antiquities, Maurice Shab, to move all the antiquities from Saida to Biblos, Jbeil, which is in the north of the country, that was considered back then safer. And in 19, you know, uh, most of the objects from Eshmoun were moved to Biblos. In the summer of 1981, members from the Phalangist Party, which is a right-wing Christian party, which back then was one of the major militias operating in Lebanon, stormed the storms of the Biblos Citadel and stole around um, 200 objects that were then sold in order to procure arms. Mm -hmm. One of these objects was this bull's head that found its way in 1996 in the storage room of a British art dealer in the Bronx. Mm. Then it moved hand to a Colorado couple of collectors, sorry, a Colorado couple, a couple of Colorado collectors that bought it and put it on display in their dining room in Colorado until 2005, where they asked two Swiss art dealers to help them sell most of their collection, including that bull's head, which wow. then changed hands and ended up in the collection of Michael Steinhardt, who was back then one of the largest philanthropists in the world, who then put it on loan at the Greek and Roman galleries at the Metropolitan Museum of Art mm -hmm. until 2014, when one of the curators from the Greek and Roman department realized that this object on display, this bull's head uh, on display in their galleries came from these looted uh, artifacts during the civil war. Mm -hmm. And that led to a large-scale investigation from the anti-trafficking unit from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office with the help of the FBI that uncovered a series of 17 art dealers that have been selling looted artifacts, not only from Lebanon, but from all over the world, to all the major collectors and museums around the world. Mm. This investigation would lead to the eventual repatriation of the bull's head alongside a few other objects from Ishmoon that had been recovered uh, back to Lebanon. But what happened when the object returned to Lebanon is that the full story could not be disclosed uh, because uh, by the end of the civil war uh, in Lebanon, there was a treaty that was signed called the, an agreement, sorry, called the Ta'if Agreement, which announced the end of the civil war. And part of the, this agreement was a general amnesty law that went into effect. That meant that all crimes committed during the war were absolved and could not be discussed in governmental institutions. And so under this amnesty law, the crime of the looting that happened in 1981 could not be brought up. And so when the then director of the National Museum of Beirut and Maria Fesh was writing the wall label describing what had happened to these objects, she was only allowed to talk about what happened before 1975, which is just the archaeological excavation. She was not allowed to talk about the looting or the subsequent sale or the, the very complex and contradictory journey that this object went on. And so Today, in a world that is really interested or thinks a lot about this question of restitution of repatriation and repatriation, the story of the bull's head is yet another counter narrative, which for me asks the very interesting question. What happens when you can return an object, but you cannot return its story? Mm -hmm. And so the expression, the return was a way to return the story back to Beirut. And the way I did that is by, since the repatriation case, which was adjudicated in New York, I was able to apply for, through a Freedom of Information Act, to get material from the Supreme Court of New York 
to get my hand, sorry, on the investigation that took place that led to this repatriation. And so I received from the Supreme Court of New York about a thousand documents that trace this very complex journey. And I pieced back these documents in order to tell this story. And the way this kind of story was staged around eight photographs that are at the center of the story, four that were taken in 1967 of the bull's head when it had been excavated, and four that were taken by agents of Homeland Security in 2017 when the object was requisitioned from the Greek and Roman galleries at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And the entire show, like the case, hinges on the fact that if these uh, whether these photos separated by 50 years were of the same object. Mm. And for me, in order to stage the late motif for this entire show, which it's also, it's always very hard also to describe artworks when you can't really see them. But <laughs> the, the setup for this entire show was happened in, in um, under light. Uh, so the windows of the galleries were tinted blue and all the lighting of the gallery was deep blue. So you enter this kind of very deep blue space and you look at these photographs and at these documents. And the reason for that blue color is these objects in Ishmoon were discovered in July of 1967, less than a month after the Six Day War. And during the Six Day War is actually the only time in the history of the Arab world where a general curfew was enacted throughout the entire Arab world in fear of imminent bombing. And during those six nights, people figured out that bomber planes could see, could not see the color blue from the sky. And people started painting their apartment windows and their car headlights blue in order to circumvent the curfew. Wow. And that's a story that my parents had told me when I was a kid. And that's a story that's very, you know, exists in the psyche of people in the region. Yeah. And in my opinion, even though that deep blue darkness lasted for only six days, there is something in that moment that I think still carries with us today. There's a moment of changing consciousness, your vision. It's as if you start looking at the world and there's this blue haze that is between you and the world. And I think that moment, very similar to the one we're going through today, mm -hmm. has the ability to radically alter our perception. And in doing so, allow us maybe to imagine even the unimaginable. Mm. Rayan Tabit, thank you very much for joining us today. You've been listening thank you for to having me. You've been listening to The Lead. This episode was produced and edited by Joshua Martin. 